Welcome to Expound, our weekly worship and verse-by-verse study of the Bible. Our goal is to expand your knowledge of the truth of God by explaining the Word of God in a way that is interactive, enjoyable, and congregational. We call this a textual community. Let's rejoice and learn God's Word in an interactive and enjoyable new way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bring to you our very lives. We present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable. It's our reasonable service. It's a privilege, Lord, a joy to gather together, to break up our week with a spiritual meal in between weekends, And to tell you, Lord, that we need you and we depend on you every single day of the week. And to worship you. Lord, this is an opportunity for us to approach the scripture in a way that very few are able to do. Verse by verse, line upon line, chapter by chapter. And to read this incredible story of how you worked in the Old Testament how people journeyed and marched by faith and sometimes by unbelief. And to learn, Lord, what those lessons could mean to our own lives now, spiritually speaking. We have great principles in the New Testament, and we see the practice and examples so often in the Old Testament. So thank you, Lord, that you preserved us and you brought us here. And uh, once again, we ask that you would speak to us We pray that our hearts would be tender as you do. And for those of us especially, Lord, who have done this a long time and have heard many of these things or read through the Bible and are familiar with it, I pray that your word would be like fresh manna to us. And if there's hardened hearts or fallow ground, break that up. Unite our heart to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God got his people out of Egypt. There's something else he has to do, get Egypt out of his people. It's one thing to take his people from Egypt. It's quite another thing to take Egypt out of the hearts of his people. Now, I think we can all relate with that. We've been saved. We've been taken from the world. That's one thing. But it's quite another thing to have the world with its values its love, its pleasure taken out of us. And that's a recurring theme throughout these Old Testament wanderings and the journey with Moses and the people of Israel. So what we've heard in the past, their complaints, we're going to hear again tonight, but about something different. Now, I wonder if Moses would have had a theme song Maybe it would be, on the road again. (laughs) Aaron and I are traveling on the road again. And it's like, there's the road again and again and again. Or maybe it would have been the long and winding road. Because for 40 years, they just sort of went around and around. Or perhaps a, a better song would be, including the children of Israel, I can't get no satisfaction. Because it seems that for 40 long years on this incredibly long camping trip, walking trip through the wilderness, that the children of Israel never stay satisfied for very long. Not only are they not satisfied, but Moses is not satisfied with their behavior. Now, in chapters 17 and 18, we get two road hazards, if you will. Hazard number one, confrontation. That's chapter 17. Hazard number two, disorganization. That's chapter 18. Now, these these are recurrent themes in all of life, everyone's life. Confrontation and disorganization. Tonight, the lessons we read about in the Old Testament, the scriptures, have application to any and all of us. In fact, it's sort of a a study just sort of in human nature itself. Now, if I were to divide it up, and I'll do that for you, 
The confrontation in chapter 17 is divided into two sections. There's confrontation from the inside and confrontation from the outside. Confrontation from the inside, Moses gets confronted by his own people, the people he's shepherding, he's pastoring in the desert. They're bent out of shape at God's provision or lack thereof in their opinion, and they take it out on Moses. So that's confrontation from the inside. That's chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Second is confrontation from the outside. A Middle East conflict with an ancient people, the Amalekites, takes place in verse 18 or verse 8 through verse 16 of chapter 17. So we have confrontation from the inside. We have confrontation from the outside. And we have, number three, administration by the qualified, and that's chapter 18. That's how I would divide it up tonight. For our purposes, I'll do that. The last time we saw the children of Israel, they complained because they had no food, especially the kind that they remembered, the leeks, the garlics, the onions. And they complained, saying, in effect, God was not able to furnish for them a table in the wilderness. Nothing could be further from the truth. For David will write some years after this, you prepare a table for me even in the midst of my enemies. God is showing his people as he tries to show us that where there is no way, God can make a way. If your economy is failing, if policies are passed, if your taxes go up, if your income goes down, I wonder if you're going to complain or say, huh, how's the Lord going to do it now? It'll be fun to watch. But David declared this, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or God's people begging bread. That's a promise that we have. Let's look at the confrontation from the inside. And this is an internal complaint from the people of Israel, God's people themselves. Verse 1 Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of Sin, that's where we saw last week, the Sinai area, according to the commandment of the Lord, and they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water. So last time it was food, now it's no water. There was no water for the people to drink. Now Rephidim can be identified today There is an oasis, the largest oasis in the Sinai area. The upper part of that oasis is a little wadi or a wash with trees and water called in ancient times Rephidim. Now, Rephidim means rest stop, rest stop. Have you ever been out on I-40 or I-25 and there's like these long uh, periods of wilderness and then there's this rest stop and you pull in and there's water to drink and there's restrooms to use. Have you ever gone to a rest stop and there's no water running or the restrooms are locked? So it says rest stop, but you're not rested when you stop. You go there for refreshment, for respite, for a rest. You go to Rephidim and Rephidim is locked up and there's no water flowing. They go to rest stop to refreshment, that's Rephidim, but they find it without water. Now, something I found interesting, I was doing a little bit of digging. We read about the children of Israel complaining here. Eight times in the Old Testament, the idea of God's people complaining is mentioned eight times. Once in Joshua, chapter 9, once in Psalm 59, all of the rest, the other six, are in the book, of Levitic, uh, the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers. They're evenly split, three and three. So most of the time, the attitude of complaining is in this wilderness wandering with Moses. Therefore, the people contended with Moses, and they said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? Now, the word tempt is interesting, test would be a better translation. The Hebrew word nasa means to put somebody to a test to see if they're faithful or not. To prove a person, to see if that person is going to act a certain way. 
let's see if God's going to provide for us. Let's, let's let him prove if he can take care of us out here in the desert. They complain against Moses. They're doing it to test the Lord. Now, why would they test the Lord about water? I mean, just, again, think back. Um, let's see. God opened the Red Sea, number one. God brought Krispy Kreme donuts from heaven, number two. God brought them a heavenly GPS system, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, protection from the elements, warmth from the cold. He's brought them food, quail, manna, and they're complaining, oh yes, this is it, we're going to die now. Really? Is it that short-lived? Now, you don't really have to go far to answer that question. It is short-lived. Because here's the truth. We are humans, and we have a human nature. And one of the strongest drives that we have, one of the strongest issues in our life, is self-preservation. If we don't get what we want when we think we want it, or when our body says, you need it now, self-preservation is a strong impulse. You recall when... Satan was having a conversation with God about Job. Remember that story in chapter 1 of the book of Job? And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him in all the earth. Satan said something very interesting, and I believe he was correct in assessing human nature. He said back to the Lord, skin for skin, yea, all that a man has will he give for his life. He, he touched upon that drive of self-preservation. Man will do almost anything to have his needs fulfilled. Skin for skin, all that a man has will he give for his life. So yes, God gave them food. Yes, God opened up the Red Sea. Cool, awesome, praise God. But I'm thirsty now. And the human body does need a high level of moisture to sustain itself, that we know. And the people thirsted there for water, verse 3. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Ah, uh, yeah, that, that, that's it. You, you, you found me out. You, you found the answers. It was the whole motive all the way along to lead you out here and have God do miracles and then kill you right here. <laughs> Amazing. So, I love this. So, what does Moses do? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, what shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. This people had gotten to the level of being out in the wilderness, yes, trusting God, yes, but driven by the impulse of the human nature to the extent that they're ready to kill the leader that God used to deliver them out of bondage. How quickly they forgot all that Moses had sacrificed and Aaron and Miriam up to this point. A true sign of spiritual growth, and it would be applied to the children of Israel, but applied to us. True sign of spiritual growth isn't how we act when we're in church, or when we're in church and life is good and life is favorable. The, the test of real growth is how we act when the bottom drops out of our life, when the water dries up, when the food dries up. Arthur W. Pink, who wrote a commentary on Exodus, said of the children of Israel, they would rather lean on a cobweb of human resources than upon the arm of an omnipotent, all-wise, and infinitely gracious God. I read that and I went, ouch, a cobweb of human resources. Well, we're thirsty. What are we going to do? What are you going to do? What is God going to do? Something has to be done now. Trusting on a cobweb of human resources rather, rather than the omnipotent God, the all-wise, infinitely gracious, all-powerful God. So they complain. They're putting God to the test. 
in reality, they're being tested to see if they'll trust the Lord or not. Now, here's what I like about what we just read in this verse. Moses does the wise thing. He's confronted with a problem. The people that he's pastoring have a problem. What does he do? They say, Moses, you got to fix this. We're mad at you. Moses is wise, and he goes to God and goes, God, what are you going to do? James said, if anyone lack wisdom, any takers for that? Anybody lack wisdom? I do, every day. If anyone lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives freely or liberally and does not upbraid or chide. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like the waves of the sea tossed to and fro. They have a problem, they bring it to Moses. Moses does what they should have done, brings it to the Lord. Lord, I need help, I need wisdom. What do I do? There's something interesting here I can't pass up. Moses is considered the lawgiver by the Jews or the deliverer by the Jews, the one that God used to deliver them from bondage. The very one that is the instrument of their deliverance is the one they want to kill. Does that sound like anybody else you know? Christ. Herein is Moses a type of Jesus Christ. The New Testament says he came into his own. His own did not receive him. Jesus came as the deliverer. They wanted to kill him. We will not have this man rule over us. So what does Jesus do? He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He, like Moses, commits himself to God. Peter, the apostle, writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, concerning Christ, who when he was reviled, he did not revile again when he suffered. He committed himself to the one who judges righteously. So herein is Moses, the lawgiver, the deliverer, a type of Christ who would be a greater deliverer. Verse 5, and the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. Horeb is that area, some believe, right next to Mount Sinai, where later on Elijah will flee from Queen Jezebel. And you will strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So Moses takes his his staff, his rod, and I don't know if this is directly or depicts it or not, but that which was once an instrument of judgment becomes an instrument of God's mercy. At one time, he threw down his rod, and it became a serpent. Now he takes up the rod, as he has done on so many other times for miraculous situation, as evidence of the power of God, and God does a miracle through it. I kind of like holding this. I kind of feel like Moses. Verse 7, he called the name of the place Massah, which means testing, and Mirabah, which means strife. (laughs) How do you think the people felt when he said, I'm going to name this strife. I'm going to name this place testing or proof because you wanted to prove the Lord to see if he was really here and would take care of you. Strife, because you contended with me, and in contending with me, you contended with the Lord, Mirabah. Because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? So God tells Moses, go up and strike the rock. Strike the rock at Horeb. Fast forward to your New Testament. Where in the New Testament, Christ typologically is seen as a rock. He's called the rock or a rock. And there's a very interesting passage of Scripture you might want to write in the margin of your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is where Paul says, for they all ate of the same spiritual food 
and they all drank of the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the rock that followed them, which is Christ. A very, very interesting passage of Scripture. Naming the rock Christ. Now, why is God, and in particular Christ, depicted as a rock? A couple of reasons. A rock is stable. Remember, Jesus is going to give a story in the New Testament about a wise man who builds his house on the rock. It's stable. It's durable. The storms of life will come, and that house will stand. It will not fall. It's durable. It'll stand the test of time. David said of the Lord, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. Also in the book of Psalms, David says, God is our refuge. It is of a strong, rocky refuge, our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. And then Jesus to Peter will say, upon this rock I will build my church. Not Peter. Peter's not the rock. Peter means a little tiny pebble. You don't want to build your church on Peter. It'd be a faulty church if you did. He was building it upon the confession that Peter made that Christ was the son of the living God. I'm going to build my church upon the confession of who I am, not who you are, Peter. So a rock is stable. A rock is durable. And the the type is the type of Christ. Number two, not only was the rock stable, in this case, the rock was struck. Now, follow me here. It was struck with a rod. Interesting, the rod that at one time became a serpent. And if I can stretch it just a little bit, that which was a serpent is what struck the rock. The rock was struck with the implement that at one time turned into a serpent. Now go back in your minds, if you remember, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, what we've called and told you before is the proto-evangelium of the Old Testament. That is Christ depicted way back at the beginning, the proto-evangelium, where a promise is given that says the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent but the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed or the Savior. Christ put on a cross, crucified, him bruised by Satan, not knowing that was the very thing that would crush Satan's dominion and power ultimately. Struck, smitten, crucified for us. Now, it's something else that's noteworthy before we move on. Tuck it away in your minds for the future. On a later occasion, Israel will once again come to a place where there's no water out in the desert. There's no wells to drink from. There's no water in their little water kits. They're out. The Lord tells Moses to go up to the rock that was in that place and go talk to the rock. To speak to it. Now what does Moses do? In anger... He strikes the rock, and he paid for it. He didn't get to enter the promised land because of it. He misrepresented God. God wasn't angry with the people like Moses was, but Moses gave off the impression that he was revealing the character of God, the attitude of God toward those people. God said, I don't want you to strike the rock. Just speak to the rock. You don't have to strike the rock. You don't have to strike Christ. He's already been smitten once, once for all. When Jesus hung on a cross, he said, it is finished, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's done. When I grew up, I grew up in a religious system that believed in the continual sacrifice of Christ, that Christ has to be crucified every time the church meets together through the implementation of certain sacraments. They called it the continual sacrifice. Christ must be continually crucified. Oh, no, not so. It's once and for all. And the act 2,000 years ago on the cross, the smiting of Christ, was once and for all time. You can't add to it. You can't take anything from it. It doesn't need to be repeated. It can never be repeated. You just speak to the rock, Moses, but he didn't. So that's the confrontation from the inside, his own people. Now let's look in verse 8 
And number two, confrontation from the outside. Now here's a Middle East conflict, not an internal complaint, an external conflict. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, first time he's mentioned in the Bible, Joshua, choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. The Amalekites, who are they? Who were they? The Amalekites were a tribe of Bedouins, these traveling, roving, predatory Bedouins in that time that occupied that southern region of the land of Canaan. The Amalekites descended from a guy named Amalek. Do you remember him? Amalek was the grandson of Esau. And Esau, you remember Esau, was the man of the flesh. He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. He didn't care about the spiritual birthright. He cared about gratifying the flesh, could care less about spiritual things. I'm not into that stuff. You can have my birthright. I'm just hungry. So Amalek becomes a type of the flesh throughout the Bible. And here we find them the first time attacking Israel. And you're going to see them attack Israel again and again. They'll be perpetual enemies for many, many years to come. Amalek is a type of the flesh. When I say flesh, I mean the evil, old, sinful, Adamic, or what comes from Adam, nature that we all have. You have two natures as a believer in Christ. The old nature, the new nature. The nature that comes from Adam, the nature that is that comes to you from Christ in being born again, the second birth. Galatians chapter 5. The flesh wars against the spirit. The spirit wars against the flesh. These two are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, before you gave your life to Jesus Christ, there was no war. You were totally under the dominion of the flesh. It dominated you. What will I eat? What will I drink? What will I put on? Those are the things that occupied your life. It was all about you. It centered on you. There was no battle with the spirit. You didn't have a spiritual nature yet. There was no conflict. You were totally under the dominion of that nature that came to all of us by Adam. As soon as you gave your life to Christ, as wonderful as it is, as wonderful as it was, as transforming as it was, after a while, you began to notice something. There's a conflict, man. There's a battle going on. I still have those impulses. I've been renewed by the Spirit, and I have desires toward the things of God, but those old things, I still battle with now. Ah, key word, you battle with them. You didn't battle with them before. You just gave yourself over to them. Now you battle with them. The flesh against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, they're contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now here's the key. You're either building up one or the other. You're feeding one or the other. You feed the flesh, the old nature, by the things of this world. And in so doing, you weaken the new nature. If, on the other hand, you feed the new nature, the spiritual nature, the Word of God, prayer, fellowship, a number of things that can do it, you build it up. If you're feeding your flesh, that's, or that's, if you're feeding your spirit, that's the key to victory over the flesh. Oh, I battle this area of my life constantly. What do I do? I'm going to face it and just start battling it. No, if you feed the spirit and are preoccupied with the things of God, giving little or no time at all to the things of the flesh, therein lies the key to victory. It's sort of like weeds. This is a good time to talk about weeds because right about now they're all over your yard. Now, did you plant those weeds? No. And it's a funny thing about weeds. Not only did you not plant them, they were probably there before you got your house. You don't have to water them. You never have to fertilize them. You never have to call the weed guy and say, could you, could you take care of my weeds so I have something to do during the summer? Would you just feed them and water them, tend them for me? No, you have to go out of your way to feed the garden, feed the lawn, take care of that, because it won't grow by itself. The weeds grow by themselves. 
So the key is to feed the spirit and not the flesh. It's something about Amalek and the Am Amalekites. The attack began as soon as they start their spiritual journey toward the land of Canaan. Very similar. As soon as we take off in our spiritual journey, that's when we discover the battle. Now, maybe not the first week. You come to Christ, life is good, life is grand. Wow, wow, wow. Answers, purpose, meaning, joy, love. But a few weeks down the line, that flesh starts rearing its ugly head again and making demands on you. Oh, not so fast. I know you're trying to go to the promised land, but remember me? Now, you're going to find something out in Deuteronomy 25, Lord willing if we ever make it that far, <laughs> toward the end of the Pentateuch. We get the insight that the Amalekites, when they attack the children of Israel, Moses will bring this up later. When they attack, they didn't attack from the front, but they attack from the back, and they attack the weak and the weary and the faltering. The, the stragglers, the people who weren't really with the pack, they were sort of lingering and straggling behind. They sort of lost their way a little bit. And I have discovered that Satan loves to attack those within the church, the stragglers. They're not always in fellowship. They don't always maintain the disciplines like oh, every now and then. And they're so open and out in the open and thus susceptible to these attacks. And so they're easy pickings. They move a little bit slower. Not the same amount of purpose and commitment in their walk. That's why it's important to maintain these spiritual disciplines that the Bible speaks about. Moses said to Joshua again, verse 9, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now who is Hur? Well, Hur is not him. <laughs> Hur is the son of a man named Caleb. Not the Caleb of Caleb and Joshua. But according to Chronicles, another guy named Caleb. But her evidently was some famous person in Israel because it just mentions him without any qualification of who he belonged to or what he did. According to Josephus, now this isn't Bible, but it is history, Josephus says that he was the husband of Miriam. Now remember, Miriam was the sister of Moses and Aaron. And according to Josephus, her married Miriam. So her was one of the relatives of Moses. So it was, when Moses lifted up his hand, uh, Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So we, we get this picture of Moses reaching up his hands and then getting tired, and then these two fellows propping them back up. But verse 9 says the rod of God was in his hand. And so Jewish commentators don't have this picture, but this picture, that he placed it horizontally, the rod, grabbing it with both hands and lifting up his arms like a banner. Why the rod of God? This symbolized the relationship God had with his people. This symbolized God's power, God's intervention, God's influence over their lives, and so that would give them courage as they would fight, and certainly to Joshua. So he'd raise it up. When he'd raise it up and his hands in the air, stretched in worship and adoration to the Lord, that's how the Jewish scribes interpret it. They prevailed. The children of Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, or his hands, and his hand in particular with the rod, that Amalek prevailed. In a spiritual battle, you need spiritual weapons. And one of the great weapons, too often neglected by most of us, is the avenue of prayer. The idea of the hands raised up is, Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm trusting you. I'm really not doing anything. Lord, you're doing it all. I'm Moses. You're doing it all. But my hand is up because I trust that you're going to work on our behalf. And so he fought the bottle, a battle. He cooperated with God in the battle in that he was praying before the Lord. It was a physical battle, but it was also a spiritual battle. I was reading in my, my devotions this last week. I was in 2 Chronicles, and I was going through chapter 16. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, one of the kings of Judah named Asa, remember Asa? 
There was David, there was Solomon, there was Rehoboam, there was Abijah, there was Asa, and then Jehoshaphat. When Asa was the king of Judah, in the 36th year of his reign, the guy up in Israel, King Baasha, started building up some of the border towns with Judah so that people down south couldn't go up north and people up north couldn't go down south, sort of cordoning off those that lived in Judah. So what does King Asa do? Well, what should he do? He should have prayed. He should have, anytime there's a problem, automatically the first thing you talk to God about. He didn't do that. He goes to the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, and he makes a deal with him. Let me give you some gold and silver and stuff from the house of God and from my house. I'll give it to you, and I'll pay you off to fight against my buddy Baasha in, in Israel. And so he invades Israel. Happy that he's won the victory. Asa's going like this in his palace. Great strategy. We did a good thing. This is smart. We figured it out. A prophet comes to him named Hanani and says, King Asa, it was stupid what you did. Now I'm paraphrasing just a little bit. It was foolish in that you have trusted the king of Syria rather than the Lord your God. You should have trusted God. You trusted the Syrian king. You're trusting in the arm of the flesh, not in the spirit. And then Hanani said, Asa, don't you remember when the Ethiopians and the Libyans revolted and all you did is pray and God routed them and sent them away? You didn't do that this time. And then the prophet said, for the eyes of the Lord moved to and fro throughout the entire earth that he might show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are committed to him. Isn't that a great verse of scripture? God's looking, looking. Who is it that will fully trust me? Who is it that will call upon my name? Who is it that will turn away from the stratagems of the flesh and just rely on me? Ah, there's one. I'm going to pour out my provision because his, her heart is totally, fully committed to me. So Moses lifted up the rod. God has worked. God will work again. Lord, our hands are up to you. We, we pour out our expectation before you. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Good move. Smart. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands on one side and on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Um, we have a question. I'll throw it up on the screen. It says, are the Amalekites and the Israelites still at war with each other? No, they're not physically. Yes, they are spiritually. The flesh will always be at war with the spirit until the going down of the sun. But historically, no, the Amalekites are a, an extinct race as far as we know. There's no pure Amalekites. When was the last time you met an Amalekite, say, in a drugstore or grocery store? I never have. They're not around anymore, and their descendants are not with us. But I'll explain a little more about that in just a moment, if you hold on. So, uh, Moses' hands getting heavy, propping up the hands on one side, then the other side, until the going down of the sun. Do your hands ever get heavy? Now, I'm speaking spiritually, of course. I'm going to say, yeah, I get really tired when I work out. <laughs> what I mean is, do your hands ever get heavy in prayer, spiritually? One of the greatest tools we have and weapons against the enemy is the avenue of prayer. One of the most neglected is the avenue of prayer. It's hard work. The Bible speaks about laboring in prayer. It gets hard to do it. In fact, because prayer is so powerful, a weapon, it's the thing Satan will attack to keep you from doing. Let me get him distracted and get him trying to figure this out in their own mind, by their own flesh, instead of trusting me. That's a distraction. It's funny, and it's sad. When you say, Lord, I'm just going to devote this time now to you. This Lord, this next whatever amount of time is yours. All of a sudden, the phone rings. The phone may have not have rung all day or all week. 
In fact, if you want to get phone calls, it's sort of a, a, a surefire thing is just pray. <laughs> or you get a knock on the door, or your mind gets distracted. You start remembering things you forgot. Oh, yeah, now I remember, and you want to write it down. Your arms get heavy. You get weary. Verse 13, so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. Why? Because Joshua will, be, will become the leader, the successor to Moses. Here he's a general fighting the battles in charge of the warfare. He will continue to do that, but he will also become the successor to Moses in terms of leadership. Write this down in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So that answers the question. It hasn't happened yet, but God makes a promise that the Amalekites are a doomed race. God is going to exterminate them all. And eventually, like many other races, they have fallen into extinction. There's no Amalekites today. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. Here, Adonai Nisi, or Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner, because the Lord was his banner. As he held that rod up in, in the form of a banner with both hands in expectation of the Lord, the Lord showed himself strong. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And can I just say, you're going to have trouble with your old nature from generation to generation. You say, well, I'm young now. You know, I'm struggling with certain things because I'm young. Okay? You'll find in middle age, you'll still struggle. When you get older, you'll still struggle. Maybe in different ways, maybe not the same capacity, but the flesh is the flesh. And you'll struggle with it until the old nature is gone, i.e., the death of the body, and you're in the presence of the Lord. The flesh wars against the spirit, Galatians 5, and the spirit against the flesh. So God dooms this race because of an unprovoked attack on his people, innocent blood, and the perpetual animosity that they will have toward Israel in the future. Fast forward. Fast forward to the book of Samuel in your minds. Where, 1 Samuel, where Saul is appointed as the king, and the prophet Samuel sends him out against the Amalekites and says, because of what they did way back then, it's time to see that fulfilled. The Lord is going to use you to be the instrument to utterly wipe them off the face of the earth. Don't spare anybody, animals, anything. Go out and wipe them out. Saul goes out and he comes back, and he goes, praise the Lord, I've done everything God wanted me to do. And Samuel goes, well, if you really did do everything God wanted you to do, how is it that I hear the bleeding of sheep? I'm hearing animals in the background. I hear background noises. And they sound an awful lot like animals. Oh, Saul said, well, I brought the best of the animals from the Amalekites to sacrifice to the Lord. I, wanna, I really want to show God how much I love him. So I, I brought him to sacrifice. Oh, and he brought King Agag, the king of the Amalekites, with him. So Samuel says, Saul, do you think the Lord has as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? For behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed or listen to God is better than the fat of rams. Because you have done this and not obeyed the voice of the Lord in utterly wiping out this race, God's going to tear the kingdom from you. You're saying, well, what's the big deal? I mean, okay, so he, he spared somebody and he spared a few people and he spared some of the animals. What's the big deal? What's the big deal about getting rid of all the Amalekites? First of all, you need to understand their history and how vile they were as a race in general. Number two... You just have to look at what happened in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, Esther, who was appointed one of the queens, and her relative, some would say uncle, Mordecai, were told, or at least Mordecai was, to bow down to a guy named Haman. Remember Haman? Haman was an Amalekite. 
if Saul would have obeyed, there would be no Amalekites. There would not have been a threat to the people in Persia. But what happened? Haman decides we have to exterminate every single Jew in the empire. And he was almost successful. But he wasn't successful because God provided a way out. But nonetheless, so close to the entire race of God's people being wiped out, God foresaw that as a possibility, so he told them, get rid of them. There's no reformation program for the flesh. What do you do with your flesh? Kill it. Starve it. Don't negotiate with it. Well, I know I'm doing this today, but tomorrow I'll do a little bit less. Just a little bit less. Not as much as today, but a little bit less. Eventually, I'll quit totally. No, you starve it. Totally starve it now. Paul put it this way. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. You take it to the cross, you crucify it, you don't negotiate with it, you starve it completely. That's the best way to debilitate and disable the flesh while cultivating the spirit. Don't negotiate. Uh, the little girl you may have heard about, she fell out of bed one night, little girl, and she was crying. Her mom came in the room and said, honey, why'd you fall out of bed? And the little girl said, I don't know. But I, I think it's because I stayed too close to where I got in. Makes sense? When we fall, it's often because we've stayed too close to where we got in. We come to Christ, but we stay so close to all the things that drag us down. And we keep plop falling, plop falling, plop falling. Move in a little bit more from the edge. Now chapter 18. See how far we can get. Here's the third that is administration by the qualified note. Here's why I like chapter 18, and it goes pretty quickly. Moses, very aggressive, very strong leader, but up to this point has been doing it all himself, not giving it to anybody else for the sake of administration. He's just sort of a one-man show, pastoring two and a half million people on his own. Joshua fights the battles. He does all the spiritual work. Fortunately, he has a father-in-law who's smart and insightful and sees what Moses is doing. And it's a great, great study in not only human nature, but in um, administration and delegation. Verse 1. And Jethro, not Bodine, Jethro, the, the priest of Midian. Midian, keep that in mind. Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land, and Gershom means stranger. And the name of the other was Eleazar, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. So these two kids were named after the experience of the parents in this case. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and wife to Moses in the wilderness where he had encamped at the mountain of God. And he said to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons with her. And so Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other about their well-being and they went into the tent. Now, at this point, you might have a question. So what's Moses' wife doing apart from Moses with the two kids? They're back in Midian. Because if you remember back in chapter 7, after they were there in Midian, they went back toward Egypt, yes? And you would infer back all the way to Egypt so that she would be part of the Exodus. Here they come out, they come to Mount Horeb, and she has been with her father, and the two kids have been with Grandpa. Probably what happened is they were on their way back to Egypt from Midian. And then that whole weird thing with the circumcision. Remember that in chapter 7? And she said, you're a bloody husband to me. Probably at that point Moses said, honey, this is going to be a tough journey. I'll catch up with you on the back loop. And sent her and the two kids back to grandpa for her spiritual well-being and 
probably for his own as well. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh, how the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way and how the Lord delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Remember, Jesus will say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jethro was a Midianite. A Midianite was related to Abraham, like the Amalekites. And the Midianites will also become enemies of Israel like the Amalekites were and will. But this Midianite is different. He seems to have heard of Yahweh, but here he becomes a believer or a convert. Now watch this. Verse 11, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Maybe before he didn't know. Maybe he had his own suspicions that, well, everybody has their own god or goddess. They're sort of all alike. All roads lead to heaven, but not now. Now I know that the Lord, Yahweh, is greater than all the gods. For in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. It could be that he became a convert through hearing all that God had done. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God, and Aaron came with the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So it would seem that Jethro, giving evidence of his faith, is now offering sacrifices to Yahweh. He'd heard Moses speak about him, but now he knows this is the true God. You know, there's nothing like your personal testimony, your story. You have a God story of how God saved you. And when you bring that personal testimony back to your friends, back to your relatives, back to your immediate family, they know you. They'll look at you skeptically. But if they can see the changes and see the evidence, it's the greatest proof. They see a changed life. They see the evidence before them. In the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 5, a man who was demon-possessed was delivered by Jesus of the demon. Wanting to follow Jesus, so excited, I'm going now wherever you go. Jesus said, no, no, go back home and tell your relatives, your friends, everything that God has done for you. Start there. Just tell them. Let them be your mission field now with your personal testimony. Well, after the reunion, after the, the meal here, after the celebration, Moses returns to his busyness, his nine-to-five job. Now watch this. And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. You think it was hard holding up the staff? Watch this. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. Oh, that sounds so noble. I'm the link to God. They come to me because they want to hear from God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you do is not good. I'm sure he thought, my father-in-law is going to see how hard I work, and I'm going to come home in the tent in the evening, and he's going to have lamb prepared and a cup of coffee, and he's going to say, son-in-law, I'm so proud of you. Good going. I saw how hard you worked today. He said, this is not good. And he qualifies it. Verse 18, both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Jethro, the father-in-law, sees that Moses has been reduced to a cosmic problem shuffler from morning till evening, trying to do everything personal needs, family needs, social problems, all by himself. 
just, just imagine the kind of things that Moses would have to listen to. He stole my sheep. <laughs> he snores every night in the tent, wakes up the neighbors. All the things he would hear all day long. It would get wearying. Now notice verse 14, the word alone. Why do you sit alone? And verse 18, you are not able to perform it by yourself. Moses, you need a team of people to do it. Here's the principle. One person, no matter how gifted, can do a ministry alone, a service alone, a task alone. Dwight L. Moody was wise. He said, I'd rather find a hundred men to do the work than to do the work of a hundred men. Moses is doing the work of a hundred men. Jethro's going, you need a hundred men to do the work. You need some administration. You need some delegation. Two reasons why. Number one, he says, you're going to wear yourself out. By the end of the day, you're going to come home and go, man, I'm just wiped out. I'm beyond my limit. Number two, you're going to wear them out. Imagine the patience it would take to stand in line to let one guy hear all the problems. Impossible. Listen now to my voice, verse 19. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. In other words, you listen to father-in-law as if God is speaking. Stand before God for the people that you may bring the difficulties to God and you will teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way they must walk and the work that they must do. Get alone with God, he says, number one, verse 19. You get alone with God. Number two, you get a hold of God's principles and you teach the law. You teach the principles of God. Get alone with God. Get a hold of God's principles Number three, get qualified people to help you. That's verse 21. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, and let them judge the people at all times. And it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves will judge. So it will be easier for you they will bear the burden with you. As time goes on, God is saying to Moses, Moses, the ministry should become easier, not harder. But you need people to help you for that to happen. Now, in Numbers chapter 11, the Lord will say to Moses specifically, select 70 elders. 70 elders. And the spirit that I have put upon you, Moses, I will take and put upon them. The same spirit I put upon you, I will put upon them, and they will bear the burden with you. Now, there's a parallel to this, just real quickly, in the book of Acts, chapter 7. The number of the disciples is multiplying. Remember the story? And there's two groups that are arguing, Hebrews and Grecians, about their widows and what they're being doled out every day. And they bring it to the apostles. And the apostles are wise, thinking like this. i got to get alone with God. i got to get a hold of God's principles. And i got to get a hold of other people to do the work. So the elders, the pastors, the apostles say, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. We'll give ourselves to word, to the word of God and the ministry of prayer. You select from among yourselves seven men filled with the Holy Spirit, full of good reputation, that we may put over that stuff. We'll get alone with God. We'll get a hold of God's principles and teach them to you. We'll get qualified people to spread out the load and do the work. And Moses chose able men of all of Israel and made them heads of the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. So they judged the people at all times, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. Then Moses' father-in-law then let Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way to his own land. Moses was a hard worker. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus worked hard. We see that he was up early, and he ministered throughout the day, and he was often very tired and went without food necessarily and water even sometimes that his family thought he was crazy. At the same time, I find that Jesus kept a beautiful balance. Yeah, there were times like that. 
But you remember the situation where he tells his disciples to come aside by themselves because they've been working so hard. Come alone, come aside by yourselves and get some rest. Get some rest. Balance out your life. Here's the rule, here's the principle as we close. Manage your life by what's important, not by what's urgent. Set priorities and then do those things and don't worry about the other stuff. Oh, but that person needs me now, maybe. Remember, the two sisters of Lazarus said, my brother's sick, Jesus, you gotta come now. Did he come? No, he stayed two more days till Lazarus was dead. Lord, you should have been here. It wasn't my time. How are you? <laughs> Incredible lesson. Do you know that Jesus was able to say to the Father, everything that you've given me to do, I've done? How could he say that? He'd only worked three, three and a half years, three and a half years of public ministry. Yes, he cured people, but there was a lot of people uncured. There was a lot of blind eyes still blind, deaf ears still deaf, people that were still dead, uncured, unhelped people all around. How could Jesus say, I finished the work which you gave me to do? You know what the answer was? Because he lived on the schedule of God's priorities for his own life. He managed his life according to the important, not according to the urgent. And Jesus got aside, the Bible says, early in the morning, and he prayed and he listened to God. And I think he learned, and we should learn from him, that daily management of simply, Lord, it's a new day. As I give myself to you, I want you to manage my time and help me to set my priorities to worship you, to love my family, et cetera, et cetera, and to live within the parameters of my gifts and my callings for me. I'm not going to save the world. I'm not going to cure the world. I'm not going to heal the world. I'm going to do what you want me to do. And then go home and get a good night's sleep. I close with a story. Billy Sunday was a baseball player years ago. He became an evangelist. When he was converted, that young man converted to Christianity, went from baseball player to evangelist. He was a very hardworking man. The counselor who counseled Billy Sunday on the day of his conversion said, William, I give you counsel of three things that you should do, priorities that you should keep in your life. If you do these things, no one will ever be able to write the word backslider after your name. William, number one, talk to God for 15 minutes every day. Number two, let God talk to you for 15 minutes every day. Prayer and the Word. Number three, spend 15 minutes every day talking to someone about God. William, if you do those three things, no one will be able to write the word backslider after your name. You'll grow in grace and knowledge. 15 minutes in the Word, 15 minutes in prayer, 15 minutes, minutes telling somebody else about Jesus. Priorities. Heavenly Father, as we close tonight, we thank you for these two chapters and the lessons in human nature and managing friends and enemies, loving both, but dealing very differently with them and coming before you with the problems that we face. Lord, not every lesson has been for all of us tonight, but every lesson has been for someone. You know our needs. You know our downsittings and our uprisings. You know our failures. Lord, I pray that when we go home tonight and when we wake up in the morning, we would begin to think about what priorities you want from us specifically, individually, what you've called us to do, us to be. And then help us, Lord, with so many things to do and so many needs in the world to be able to discern what your will, what your calling for us is based upon the passions that you have given to us and based upon the gifts that you have entrusted to us. 
Lord, may we be men and women of the word and men and women of prayer and men and women who make Christ known. And Lord, I pray if anyone here tonight is struggling, is backsliding, is going the other direction, has been feeding the flesh and not the spirit, as they've come tonight to get their spirit watered and fed and strengthened, I pray, Lord, that they would continue in that and grow in that and become disciplers of others. Lord, we all have Amalekites. We all have the flesh. They're very unique to who we are. And you know our weakness. You know we get attacked when we're tired and straggling and struggling. Pick us up, Lord, and lift up our hands and strengthen our knees and make us dependent upon you so that the enemy will flee as our lives are in dependence as we lift the rod up. In Jesus' name, amen.